This is a simple example of power transmission between two parallel axes. In this case, we have two spur gears. They're metric spur gears with a three millimeter module, 16 teeth per gear. And so the speed ratio is equal to one. All we are doing is changing the direction of rotation from one axis to another. We have to be certain that we can mesh the gears together so they have to have the same module so that the teeth of one gear do not crash into the bottom land of the other gear and there is also sufficient width of space. We need to know the forces that are acting between these gear teeth so we can properly calculate whether or not these gears will survive the service conditions. This animation shows simply that we are changing the direction of rotation as we move from one gear to another. We can do a more complicated animation where we increase the size of the second gear. I now have twice as many teeth on the upper gear as the lower gear. And so the speed of the upper gear would be half the speed of the lower gear. It's also true that the torque generated about the axis of the upper gear would be twice the torque of that at the lower gear. We're now ready to move a bit further with gears and discuss gear trains. The key concepts of today's lecture include an understanding of interference between teeth, how we can guarantee meshing without interference, and what the forces are on the gear teeth. So let's just imagine that we have two gears that are in mesh. I show here a pinion with a diameter DP and a gear with pitch diameter DG. We call the pinion component two in the gear component three, usually because component one is either the frame or the power source that we're using for input to the pinion. In this case, we are imagining that there is an angular velocity omega p for the pinion and it is spinning clockwise. That would force the gear to spin counterclockwise at some omega g. And we know when we do this that we will have a supplied input torque and that input torque is going to be related to a tooth force. We have already discussed that the tooth force itself is going to occur at a pressure angle, which is given by phi, and we usually have pressure angles of 20 degrees. And so we know that if we were to take these two components apart, that at the pitch point where they interact, because I am applying a clockwise torque as an input, that we are going to be pushing on the gear, that's component three over here. So component two is pushing on the gear at component three. So long as we are using spur gears, we are only going to be generating tangential, which we're going to call WT, and radial forces, WR. There will be equal and opposite forces acting back on the pinion. And so our goal is to figure out what this WT happens to be. And so we know that the input torque is going to be equal to WT times the radius, which would be the pinion pitch diameter divided by two. Now that would be a torque in inch pounds in the English system or Newton millimeters in the metric system. So we're going to have to do some conversions. We're usually going to want this in foot pounds and we're usually going to want this in Newton meters. So there's going to be some conversions that are required. Now the other thing that we know is that the output torque, because again we are applying a tangential force, that's how we give it the name WT, that's multiplied by the gear diameter divided by 2. And so it, it's a relatively straightforward thing to understand that the output torque is going to be related to the input torque through the pitch diameters as shown here. But we also need to understand that the gears mesh if the diametral pitches are equal to each other. As a minimum, meshing requires that the diametral pitch is the same or the module is the same for each of the gears. And so if that is the same, we know that the diametral pitch is just equal to the number of teeth divided by the pitch diameter. And so it turns out that the output torque is related to the input torque through the tooth count ratio as shown here. And 
we also know that the output speed is going to be related to the input speed through the inverse of that tooth ratio. So we have these basic relations that are clear. The other thing we know is that the power transmitted is going to be a torque times an angular velocity. So if we're in the metric system, our torque would be in newton meters. Our omega is always in radians per second. And so our input power is just going to be our input applied torque times omega in, and our output power is the output torque times the output speed. These torques are simply related to each other, and that is the output torque is going to be equal to the number of teeth on the gear divided by the number of teeth on the pinion times the input torque, and the output speed is going to be equal to the number of teeth on the pinion divided by the number of teeth on the gear times the input angular velocity. And that says that the output power is going to be equal to the input power. And so we have a no loss power transfer. That's under ideal situations. Now, the next thing that we need to talk about is we've got to sort out, bottom line, what the tangential forces are acting on the teeth. The only way we are going to be able to get at our lifing our gears is if we know what WT is. So we need this tangential force that's acting on the tooth because once we have that tangential force, then we can figure out all the other forces that are acting on that tooth because we know the pressure angle of the tooth force. And so we need to understand that the pitch line velocity is just an omega times R, and that is just going to be equal to our omega times the pitch diameter divided by 2. Now, if we get uh, our input speed in RPM rather than in radians per second, we can always convert our radians per second angular velocity into RPM by multiplying omega times 60 seconds and dividing that by 2 pi radian. And we also know that omega is going to be equal to 2 pi n over 60. And so we know that the velocity, say, of the pinion, if we know the angular input speed, it's going to be 2 pi n over 60 times the pinion diameter divided by 2. We can get rid of these 2s, and so we have pi n dp over 60, and that is going to give us a speed in inches per second. If we want this in feet per minute, our pitch line velocity is just going to be equal to pi times the pitch diameter times n divided by 12. And this is a key finding that allows us to convert RPMs using our pitch diameters into a pitch line velocity as measured in feet per minute. So we measure d in inches, we have n in RPM, and that gives us feet per minute. Now, what we really want to do is if we know the power input, then we want to find the tangential load WT acting on the gear. It turns out that if you have your power as measured in horsepower, and if you have your pitch line velocity in feet per minute, then your tangential force is just equal to 33,000 times H over V. And remember, that is for H measured in horsepower and V in feet per minute using this pi dn over 12 to get that pitch line velocity in feet. So this is this crazy English system up here. If you want to do it metric, the tangential force measured in kilonewtons is equal to 60,000 times the, times the power input measured in kilowatts divided by pi dn, or d is in this case going to be measured in millimeters in our n in RPM. So keep in mind that that tangential force from this 60,000 h over pi dn gives us the tangential force in kilonewtons for an input power in kilowatts, a pitch diameter in millimeters, and a speed in RPM. Now's a good time for an example. I'm going to show here a two-stage gearbox because we have two gear reductions going on. I have a gear down here, which I'm calling gear two, and that gear is the input 
pinion. It has 20 teeth on it. It is driving gear three. Gear two is at axis A. Gear three is at axis B. It has 50 teeth on it. It is then driving gear four over here at axis C, which has 30 teeth on it. So gear two drives gear three, and it does so at 1750 RPM with an input power of 2.5 kilowatts. Furthermore, we chose gears that have a module 2.5 millimeters and a pressure angle of 20 degrees. Same gears throughout. They all have to have the same module and pressure angle so that they will mesh together. So what we're going to do is try to figure out what the tangential force is on the gears. And we're going to start by separating gear 2 from gear 3. We recognize and understand that gear 2 is rotating counterclockwise, which drives gear 3 clockwise. That means we are applying a tangential force on gear 3, which will be pointing to the left. I have an equal and opposite tangential force pointing to the right on gear 2, which is countering the input torque. Now, because I have gear tooth forces that are inclined at some pressure angle of 20 degrees, we know that I also have a net force pointing downward and to the right on gear 2 and upward and to the left on gear 3. Three, those give rise to radial forces, and the magnitude of those radial forces are related to the pressure angle. In the last section, we talked about how we could find the tangential force from an equation that relates tangential force to input power. And for the metric units, that tangential force is 60,000 times the input power in kilowatts divided by pi dn, where we measure d in millimeters and n is in RPM. Well, we know N, we know H, we don't know D, but what we do know is that the module M is 3 millimeters per tooth, and D is just going to be equal to that module times the number of teeth, and in this case, that would be for the pinion, our D of the pinion would be 3 millimeters times 20 teeth, which gives us 60 millimeters. So that means our WT is 60,000. We multiply that by the input power of 2.5 kilowatts. We divide that by pi, 60 millimeters times N which is 1,750 RPM, and we find that our tangential force is going to be equal to 0.455 kilonewtons. Remember, the output of this equation is in kilonewtons, so that our tangential force is 455 newtons. Well, now we go back here and look at our gears and note that that tangential force is 455 newtons. It's acting on both gear 2 and gear 3. We also know that my tangent of the pressure angle is going to be equal to my radial load divided by my tangential load. And so my radial load is going to be equal to 455 newtons times the tangent of the 20 degree pressure angle. And that gives me a radial load of 165.5 newtons. If we were to look at gear two, then we would note that we have this radial load of 165 5.5 newtons pointing downward, a tangential load of 455 newtons pointing to the right. It meshes over here with gear 3, and so I'm going to have a separating load of 165.5 newtons and this 455 newton pointing to the left in this case. Now this gear is free to rotate about axis B, but it's going to require reactions BX and BY to keep it from moving. The other thing that we know is that if we are operating at steady speed, then the torques have to be balanced. So the WT applied at the pitch point with gear two is going to be equal to the WT applied at the pitch point with gear three. That's 455 newtons. And I also know that because these tangential and radial forces are related through the pressure angle, that the WR is going to be 165.5 newtons. So we know all the forces that we have acting, except for the reaction forces at BY and BX. Well, we can take the sum of the forces in the X and the Y directions to get those. And if we do that, we will find that BY equal to 
289.5 newtons. Likewise, my Bx is going to be 289.5 newtons. So there's all the forces that are acting on gear three. Now we have this two-stage gearbox. We have gear two applying these tangential and radial forces to gear three, which rotate gear three. We have gear three applying forces to gear four, which rotate gear four. So we know that gear two is counterclockwise, gear three is clockwise, gear four is going to be counterclockwise again. And the speed, and the rotation of gear three is just going to be the tooth ratio n2 to n3 times omega 2 and omega 4 is going to be n3 over n4 times omega 3. Now we could replace these with the n's, the rpms, it makes no difference. We have these very nice speed ratios. We usually want to know the output speed as a function of the input speed. Well we know that n4 which is the output is n3 over n4 times n3, but n3 is n2 over n3 times the input speed. And so this becomes our relationship between our input speed and our output speed. And this term in here is called the train value for that gear train, and it is given the symbol E. So the train value, you will notice, is the product of the driving teeth divided by the product of the driven teeth in the denominator, and that gives us the train value E. In this case, if you look at that train value, you will note that we have N3 in both the numerator and the denominator, so it drops out, and it is called an Idler. So that means that gear three is an idler. And so the final output RPM would be equal to N2 over N4 times the input. And N2, we said, was 20 tooth gear. N4 is a 30. Multiply that by the 1750 RPM. We find that our output RPM is 1167 RPM.